I have a million dollar idea that's just waiting for investors. <laughs> Many of you know that I have, I have a pretty big family. I got six kids. And for some reason, they keep uh, outgrowing the clothes that I buy them. They keep <laughs> eating all the food that I buy them. And now I have three licensed or permitted drivers. And so I'm constantly looking for a side hustle to create awareness and, and, to, and, to, and to boost my income and things like that. Um, but I have an idea, um, and it's to solve an important problem. Okay, many of you know that in, in Southwest Airlines, uh, when you get on a flight, uh, you have to kind of fight for your seat, right? I, I don't know about you, but when I travel, I am the last person to board a plane. If, you, if I have a seat assigned, I will be the physical last person. I will wait till they do final call. No serious, final call. No, Steve, we see you stand up and walk towards the gate. Um, I'm that guy, okay? But for some reason, uh, Southwest has made it to where their planes load quickly because they make everyone treat it like it's the last plane out of a refugee war zone. Okay, hustle now, you're gonna make it, you're gonna make it. Go, 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 go. Um, but we're all fighting for seats and it's weird that moment when you're trying to make sure you, you, who you're gonna sit next to, you never know. And so I have an idea for a t-shirt company that sells shirts that guarantee you, you get your own row on Southwest Airlines. Okay, because there's all these things that people do to make sure uh, people don't sit with them. Maybe you look aggressive when someone's walking by. You get your seat, you sit on the edge, and you're looking aggressive, and people don't want to sit next to that guy. Um, or maybe you just pretend you don't see him, or maybe you just lay down. I don't know. There's all these different strategies people use, but how about this shirt? You wear a shirt, and people just, well, God, it's not worth the effort. And I already have one shirt idea. The first shirt idea is, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus, Okay. <laughs> And, and, not, and not because evangelism isn't important, but because most of us has, have the uncomfortable experience of, of being bothered for Jesus, right? Most people, when they, what they think is evangelism is actually just anonymous harassment. They're just bothering people and no one wants that. And so that will call it, but I have a new idea. I have another idea. And the, the, the second shirt idea, it just simply says this. How about that election, right? <laughs> Again, not because politics doesn't matter, but because most people, uh, most people who want to talk about politics don't want to be disagreed with and they want to shout you down, right? What's the definition of a fanatic? Someone who won't change their mind but can't change the subject. And so uh, in case you haven't heard, there is an election coming. And I'm not here to talk to you about whether or not you should vote. You should. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I'm not even going to tell you... Um, I'm not going to tell you whether or not religion and politics stay separate. I think your Christianity should change the way you should, should affect how you vote. But I want to talk to you about something more today. I want to talk to you about something bigger and something more important. I want to talk to you about your citizenship. Not your citizenship in he, in, on earth, because if you are a follower of Jesus, you carry dual citizenship. Your passport might say America or whatever country you, uh, you belong to, but the truth is your citizenship is in heaven. Paul uh, Paul says in, in uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven. And this is an important thing, especially in this time around, around, um, around election time when, when emotions get high and stress and people on, I've seen churches, I've seen neighborhoods, I've seen friends divided over this subject. And sometimes we lean a little too much into our earthly citizenship. Don't get me wrong. I love America. My father served in the military. I think America might be one of the best, freest and best nations uh, to ever exist but it's not the hope of the gospel. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you are called to be a citizen of heaven. And so I wanna to talk today about our heavenly citizenship. I wanna talk about how we can learn to lean, understand what it is and lean into that. Let's so open your Bibles to Philippians chapter three. Philippians chapter three. And the, the most important thing we can talk about first, the, the first thing we need to talk about is the meaning of heavenly citizenship. The meaning of heavenly citizenship. Because here's the deal. Uh, citizenship means, uh, meant something slightly different in the ancient world. Okay, if I talk to you about what does it mean for you to be an American citizen, most of us would couch uh, our definition in terms of rights, privileges, and location. Rights, privileges, and location. We would say, because I'm American, this is how you have to treat me. Because I'm American, this is the things I get to do. And because I'm American, if I don't live there now, one day I might go there and live there uh, in the future. It's where I live, okay? That is not what the ancients thought about when it talked about uh, heavenly citizens. Paul is writing this letter to uh, Philippi, Philippians. Uh, Philippi was a city in Northern Greece, but what's interesting is um, though they, were, they spoke Greek, they were ethnically Greek, the Philippians were Roman citizens. In fact, if you go read Acts chapter 17, the stuff that lands Paul in the Philippian jail, 
Remember the story of Paul and Silas singing praise in the Philippian jail? Um, they were drugged before a, a Roman magistrate and they said, these guys are teaching us to, to believe in things. It's not appropriate for us as Romans to believe. They saw, even though they were ethnically one thing, their language was one thing, they, thought, they saw their identity as something else because that was, who they, that was the primary way they saw themselves, Roman citizens. Well, what does it mean for them to be Roman citizens? It's not that, that they were going to go back to Rome one day. Rome was a very crowded city uh, and there were not a lot of jobs. No, You're, being a Roman citizen didn't primarily ensure that that's where you could go live one day. It wasn't even about your rights. Uh, there were rights that went on with being a Roman citizen. Paul couldn't be, a Ro no Roman could be crucified. Every Roman had the right to appeal to Caesar. There were rights that came along with that. But being a citizen of Rome was primarily about your responsibilities was about your responsibilities. You see, uh, they had been placed where they were as a little outpost of Rome. That they had been, Rome had decided that this was a place that wasn't expressing or living out their Romanness well. And so they took a bunch of Roman citizens and they put them in this area and they said, we want you to transform this area by living out your identity as Romans and making this little place where we've put you as an outpost of Rome. That is who Paul is talking to when he writes the book of Philippians. People who saw their mission in life to turn where they were as an outpost of Rome. And Paul says, no, no, I want you to see yourself as citizens of heaven. Which means the meaning of your heavenly citizenship is not primarily, in this context, going to, be, going to heaven when you die. If you're a follower of Jesus, that will happen. Jesus says he went to prepare a place for you. Uh, Paul says to be absent from the body means to be present with the Lord. Jesus told the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in paradise. Um, but when Paul tells these people about being citizens of heaven, what he's talking about is the fact that we have been stationed in a specific place at a specific point in history with a specific group of people in order to represent the ideals and goals and purposes of heaven where we are. And so being a citizen of heaven is primarily about living out the Lord's prayer, that part of the Lord's prayer specifically, which says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what it means to be a citizen of heaven, to see yourself as, as a representative of heaven and you're responsible to live out the ideals and values of heaven and to turn your little corner of the world into a little outpost of heaven. And so how we do this is by looking at what Paul says in the, in the verses surrounding. He starts off in verse 17 by talking about the model of citizenship. The model of citizenship. Verse 17 says, Join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. He says, if you want to be a citizen of heaven, you first better find other people who are living that out for you. And he gives us three aspects of what it means to, to find good models to look, at, look for. First, he says, you need to be looking for examples in community. We need community. He says, join in imitating me. Uh, we live, uh, America is an independent place, but sometimes we take that independence too far. Um, we, we don't like talking about dependence and most of us live in isolation. Our men's ministry has a, uh, has a statement that's true for everybody. It's, uh, it's alone is dangerous. But for some reason, we've turned, uh, we've turned Christianity into something that individual people do with their spare time. We consume it in podcasts, in cars. We listen to, 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 to online speakers when we are, uh, can't sleep at night. But the truth is, most of us uh, resist community. But Paul says, join in following my example. Pick a group of people that are following well and be a part of them. You need a community of people. In fact, you probably have one. And whatever, that, whatever your primary community is, is the thing that's shaping your identity. Uh, your primary community is the thing that's helping you be a better version of whatever they're, they're committed to. Are they citizens of heaven? We need community. Two, uh, we need mentors. Paul says, join in following my example. Christianity is an imitating and mentoring faith. It's not about primarily things to believe. There are things to believe and know. It's primarily people to follow. Follow Jesus. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me because I'm following Jesus. Imitate me because I'm imitating Jesus. Do what I do. Okay? You need people who are following Jesus that you can follow along with. And then third, he says, we need multiplicity. Join in following my example and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. So follow me, do so in community, and pick out not just one example, but a, uh, but a whole bunch of different examples so that if one person goes off the rails, you're not going to go with them. 
Many people know, remember that, that uh, Disney show about lemmings in Alaska, how one of them goes off a cliff and they all just kind of keep going after and keep going after and keep going after. Paul says, no, the only fallible uh, person is Jesus. That's the only person you can infallibly follow. Everybody else who's following Jesus is an imperfect person. Um, so pick out a couple of different people who are following well and follow all of them together. That way, if one of them goes off the rails, uh, you're not going to go off the rails with them. So the first thing Paul says is, if you want to be a citizen of heaven, you better have good mentors. You better have a good community. You better have good people uh, that you can follow well. Because uh, Paul says later on in 1 Corinthians 15, he goes, you, uh, bad company corrupts good morals. You become like who you are around all the time. And so surround yourself by people who see their identities as citizens of heaven and follow people who see themselves as citizens of heaven. Next, Paul gives us the marks of a citizen. He does so in an interesting way. Um, he describes people who aren't living this out. A look at verse, uh, verses 18 and 19. He says, For I've often told you, and now say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is in their stomach, their glory is in their shame, and they are focused on earthly things. He gives us the marks of citizenship, but he does so in an interesting way. He tells us the negative. This is what happens when you don't follow well, when you, when you, when you end up walking away from the faith unintentionally. He says there are people who started out walking, and now they're enemies of the cross of Christ. They didn't wake up going, I'm going to turn from Jesus. They just kind of drifted away. Well, what do those people look like, and how can we be different than them? Well, first, he says they have different destinations. Different destinations. He says their end is destruction. Now, please don't, please don't get me, uh, please don't misunderstand me. One of the most commonly misunderstood aspects of, of, of the biblical story is the nature of God's judgment. Uh, sometimes we think God is some powerful and vindictive and clueless CEO who's randomly smiting people who disagree with him. And that's not how judgment works. Okay, we all know John 3, 16, but we often forget John 3, 17, that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. This is condemnation. And people like the darkness more than light. Uh, the, the idea is that a life lived towards slavery to self and, and committed to sin leads to a specific destination. Uh, Romans 3.23 says the wages of sin is death. This is, the, this is what sin pays out. The culmination of a life dedicated to serving sin, this is where it goes. And so the first thing he goes is realize that, that where, what is the destination of the path that you're on? It's destruction. And so a citizen of heaven has a different destination. Two, they have different deities, different deities. This might sound weird, but it's uh, their God is their appetite. It says people who are enemies of the cross of Christ, their God is their appetite. What they feel like doing, they do. Um, we live in a world where, uh, where we believe that if it's natural, it's normal. And if it's normal, I should do it. Um, so if I'm hungry, I eat. If I have any other appetites, I do those. Um, but we don't realize that the biblical picture is your and my appetites are broken by sin, which means we want things that aren't good for us. Okay, just because your body's telling you to want it doesn't mean it's good for you. Uh, Philippians, or not, Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads only to death. What you want, what you think will bring happiness doesn't work. That's one of the reasons I love, love this church, right? Our mission statement, our mission statement, inviting all people to experience what? True fulfillment, where in Jesus Christ. It's not that other people aren't looking for true fulfillment places. That's everybody in life is looking for something that will bring you true fulfillment. And the message of scripture is, guess what? Your looking is broken and you want things that aren't gonna bring you true fulfillment. And the, the true fulfillment is found in only one spot and that's in Jesus Christ. And that's why Proverbs tells us in Proverbs 3, he says, he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So don't go with your gut feeling on things. Go with what God says is what you're supposed to actually want and see if that doesn't take you to a different destination. Next, he talks about different delights. He says, people are enemies of the cross of Christ. Have, uh, they, 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 um, they, their glory is in their shame. The things they are most proud of are the things they should be ashamed of. It's one of those things that another question people like to ask me and always wonder about. What about, the, Jesus mentions a sin against the Holy Spirit that can't be forgiven. Like, did I commit the sin against the Holy Spirit? If you worry about it, the good news is you haven't, okay? That's the way it works. What, what is the unforgivable sin? It's a sin that you never think to ask forgiveness for because you don't think it's sin. If you serve sin long enough, if you live in sin long enough, you will, be, you will come to love your sin and can't imagine your life apart from it. 
and you will not want to be delivered from it. In fact, you can't even think why anybody would want to, want to, to decide to think it was wrong. He says, eventually, if you're not following the right people, if you're listening to your, if you're engaged in a lifestyle of sin and you're serving your own appetites, you will find a place where you don't actually think that anything you're doing is wrong. You glory in your shame. And then finally, the, the fourth thing he says about our marks of a citizen, he says, they uh, set their mind on earthly things. They set their mind on things. So citizens of heaven have a different determination. The people who are enemies of the cross of Christ, they're focused on earthly things, of, of seeking fulfillment in, in all and what the world promises will, um, will, will bring you contentment and peace and joy and lies. You see, uh, John says in 1 John 2, 15 and 16, he says this, don't love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now he can't mean, he can't mean lo don't love people because this is the same John that wrote John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he sent his son. World in that context means people. Um, world in first John here means a way of looking at the world, a way of looking at the world um, where you set your mind and your hopes and your dreams and your expectations and your, and your desires on worldly things. Paul sa uh, John says, everything in the world, um, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions is not from the Father, but is from the, from the world. Those three things, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, I actually prefer a different translation that says the boastful pride of life, because all three of those things show you what it means to set your mind on earthly things. One, lust of the flesh. If you think that fulfillment will be found by seeking some pleasure, that you're, that you're not happy right now because you're missing some pleasure. It would be food or travel or some other appetite, physical pleasure. If you think you'll find fulfillment by getting more of it, you're wrong. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. If you think you will find fulfillment by gathering a whole bunch more possessions, that your issue is that, um, your issue is that you don't have enough stuff. That's what commercials are, right? Commercials are little worldly parables that tell you how your life will be different if you acquire this possession, Okay? And if boastful pride of life, if you think you will find happiness by exalting yourself over another person, if you can get, just get that promotion, then your life will have meaning and then you will know you're significant. That is what it means to set your mind on earthly things. These, I want these things and if I have those things, then I will know that I matter and then I will have that peace and fulfillment that I long for in other places. And Paul says here in all these other places, that's not where you will find it. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. A citizen of heaven is somebody who, who's, doesn't, who understands that, that pleasures are a gift from God and possessions are a gift from God and positions are a gift from God, but ultimately the true fulfillment comes from the source, not from seeking those things. And finally, uh, Paul concludes with the mission, the mission of citizenship. He says, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly wait for a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. He goes, because this is who God is, because this is what he calls us to, to set, set our mind on things above, here is what he calls us to here and now. And the first thing is stewardship, is stewardship. We eagerly await for a savior from there. So Paul says, we eagerly wait for a savior from there. Again, you're going to go to G be with Jesus when you die, that's, but that's not what he's, Paul is addressing here. The picture is, as citizens of heaven, one day, like an emperor visiting all the different outposts and colonies, one day Christ is going to return and inspect our work, and we expect a savior to come and inspect the work that, that we've been investing in. So stewardship, learning to take, see everything we have as a gift from God and learning to, to, uh, to try and transform, do what we can with what we have where we are. The truth is most of us, uh, most of us uh, like to think uh, that real life is happening somewhere else. Most of us decide that fulfillment is over the next hill or in some other place. Most people think they'd be happier if they were with, some, with someone else doing something else somewhere else. Maybe, just maybe, you've been put exactly where you are for exactly the role that God has for you to do exactly a job that only you could do. And you're missing it because you, you, you wanna, you're trying to escape and get someplace else. God entrusts us with a stewardship. Uh, Paul says in Ephesians 4, we're, uh, we're held together by what every joint supplies. One of the things I love about this church is the constant perpetual encouragement for every one of us to find our place and find our gifts and learn to use them well for the benefit of the kingdom. God has given you a task and he calls us to steward that task well. Not just stewardship, but he calls us to live in hope. 
Verse 21 says, he will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body. He will do it. Sometimes when you are when, like, like, a, like a Roman citizen posted on the outpost of a frontier, sometimes life can get pretty chaotic. Life can get pretty hard. Life can get pretty overwhelming. And sometimes it can feel like evil is winning. And uh, Paul says, a citizen of heaven learns to live in hope. Live in hope. This is, the, this is the perpetual call all throughout the New Testament, which is, uh, which is don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, right? Just to not be, it, the reason we said it is because it's possible to be overcome by evil because people get down by it. No, we realize that God has placed us in a specific place to steward it well, but he hasn't called us to fix the problem. He calls us to do what we can with what we have, where we are, but then to live in hope that one day he will do everything he promises to do. One of my favorite verses actually comes in Revelation 21, my favorite chapters in the Bible. Uh, Revelation 21, it's a picture of what happens when Christ returns and there's gonna be a new heavens and a new earth because the former earth, heaven and the former earth will pass away. And li listen to what uh, the writer John says, uh, verses four and five of chapter 21. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Crying, grief, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Then... The one seated on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. Uh, there's a, a different translation that says, behold, I am making all things new. I like that translation better because it reminds me. It reminds me that, that God is saying, behold, I make all things new, not I will make all new things. It means that God promises to restore what's fallen, to fix what's broken, to heal what's been, what's been destroyed. It's the promise that, that when you look at all the evil in the world, that God sees it and knows it better than you do. And God promises one day that there will not be a single place in this world where sin and death will be allowed to stand. That he promises to wipe away every tear from every eye and sin and death and weeping and mourning will be no more. And in the process, and while we wait for that, we're called to live in hope. We're called to live in hope. That's why, uh, that's why Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, his great chapter on the resurrection, uh, where he says, therefore you be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your work in the Lord's not in vain. That God's put you in a specific place to be a steward and then to live in hope that the stuff you've invested in for the kingdom's sake will actually be a part of that new heavens and new earth that one day God promises to make. To live in hope. And then last calls us to live in dependence. Dependence. He says to transform us by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. By the power that he has. The power for our mission comes from him. Again, it's this weird independence thing that a lot of American, specifically American men have. We think that, that our job is to kind of be like a fighter, pilot, a fighter pilot. We might get the fuel from God, but it's our mission. We're going to do it under our own gas, under our own intellect. That is not a biblical picture of what, of what it means to be a citizen. The biblical picture comes from John 15. John 15, John 15, 5, where, where Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. You can do nothing without me. So the goal is to stay connected to the vine and to draw the power that, that, God, that God has for us. He calls it in the Lord's Prayer, he calls it daily bread. Come back tomorrow and get what you need for tomorrow's work as well. How's this hitting you? What part of this is the most challenging thing? Have you, been, uh, have you never heard the gospel before and, and you didn't realize that, uh, that God has called you out of, out, of, um, out of darkness and into light, out of sin and into, and into life? You know, sometimes we, we equate the gospel only with just the forgiveness of the penalty of our sin. But Paul actually describes it this way in Colossians 1.13. He says that Christ, he rescued us, or God has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. That it's not just forgiven of the penalty of your sin debt. It's actually the, the, the deliverance of you from the slavery of sin and, a, and, a, and to give you a new passport and a new citizenship and a new life in his kingdom. Where are you living today? Do you realize you are, you're a citizen of heaven? If you, if you do, are you living like it? Do you have mentors you're following? Who are you following and who are you following with? Are you in, are you in danger of, of, of walking away and, and living as an enemy of the cross of Christ, worshiping the God of your own stomach and setting your mind on earthly things? Are you willing to believe that God has placed you exactly where he wants you to do the work he's called you to do for his glory and for your good 
and he calls you in the midst of it to live in hope that he'll do what he says he's going to do and to live in dependence upon him to give you what you need for today. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you know that this world is broken and fallen apart. Forgive us for all the ways in which we, uh, we get sidetracked and distracted, where we think something else will fix the problems. Thank you for the reminder that we are citizens of heaven. Thank you that you're in the business of transferring people out of the domain of darkness and, and giving us citizenship in your heavenly kingdom. Help us to live that way. May our, constantly, may our lives be constant testimonies to the fact that we believe that you are at work in this world for your purposes. And may we see in our midst your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I pray this in your son's name. Amen. Hey, Pastor Ryan Rush here, and I just want to thank you for being with us at Kingsland Online today. What an honor. But I'll tell you what would be even better. We'd love to see you get connected with the physical church in the days ahead, if you haven't already. And that means maybe if you're local in the West Houston area, we'd love to see you at Kingsland. Otherwise, regardless, we'd love to help you facilitate uh, jumping into a local church near you, and we can do that together. You can go to kingsland.org slash online connect, kingsland.org slash online connect to find out next steps on your journey. Listen, thanks again for being with us today at Kingsland Online.